Okay, welcome back after that short break. Um, we've got Sebastian Druge. Druge. Um, I'm not a native German speaker. Uh, who's going to speak to us about GStreamer in the living room and outer space. Thanks. Um, so first, some words about me. Um, so I'm a long-term GStreamer developer since now almost 10 years. Did the last few releases after that guy back there got a bit bored making the releases and probably uh, worked on every part of it until now. I'm also one of the co-founders of uh, Centricular, which is a consultancy offering services around GStreamer and graphics and other uh, multimedia related free software. And well, that's about me, so let's get started with the um, talk. Um, today, um, first I'll give a short introduction, what is GStreamer, but really, really short, and then um, just give you like, uh, well, like a gallery of things that uh, people are doing with GStreamer, all kinds of uh, fancy things, because for some reason, uh, people um, usually have a very um, limited view of what is actually possible with this. So, as said, just a very short introduction, what is GStreamer? Um, if you want more details, go to the website. It has everything you would possibly want to know. So what do we have? Um, it's a pipeline-based multimedia framework. We have very basic building blocks. We have elements that are somehow connected by, via pads. That's how we uh, call our stuff. Basically, it's um, like Lego for um, data processing pipelines. You have some component producing something, then data comes out, goes into something else, and in the end, you get it on the screen, speakers to the network or similar. Um, in the end, what we have there is a set of uh, libraries with a very abstract API, and um, all the actual functionality is provided by plugins. And often, we are just wrapping other libraries like um, libav, ffmpeg, opencv, all kinds of codex libraries. So we don't do any codex ourselves. We build upon the work done by others. We just provide um, some uh, yeah, glue API on top of that, some, um, some way to um, use all these completely different libraries in a um, consistent and um, well, in the same way in the end with one generic API. And um, well, as I said, it's all uh, provided by plugins and our main idea here is um, that we provide something for everything. So um, whatever you want to do multimedia related, you can be sure we have something to do exactly that. Um, well, overall, it's, um, as I said, it's an open source uh, multimedia framework. Currently, it's LGPL 2.1 license, so you can also use it in proprietary applications, and we also allow proprietary plugins to be used. It's completely cross-platform. We run on Linux, embedded Linux, Windows, OS X, iOS, Android, all kinds of BSDs. Basically, everywhere where you have a C compiler and uh, well, a bit of higher level operating system, um, what we also do uh, nowadays is uh, providing binary SDKs for Windows, uh, OS X, iOS, and Android. And uh, yeah, um, so at the low le lowest level, what we have is a stable, the object-based C API. Um, well, it's I said it's a C API, but um, thanks to the object, everything is uh, kind of um, object-oriented, like you would know from all kinds of other languages. And also thanks to the object. Um, we have bindings for every language you would like to write your application in. So we have stuff for Python, C++, even for JavaScript, .NET. Um, now there's something for Java and Go. And if you look on the internet, there are bindings for any language you would like to use. Now, um, the main motivation for this talk is what um, people usually think if they hear the name GStreamer, so what it's not. It's not a media player or playback library. It's also not a codec or protocol library. We are not uh, in competition with FFmpeg or something. We are building on top of their stuff. It's also not a transcoding tool or a streaming server, but it's something that can be and is used for building all these things. And well, on the next slides, I will give an overview of um, or, yeah, some kind of gallery of all kinds of things that people are actually doing with it. So um, first, the boring stuff the stuff that probably everybody here uses and where GCMA was used first. Um, all the big uh, desktop environments on Linux, stuff like GNOME, Enlightenment, XFCE, KDE, they are uh, the, using GStreamer for media playback, um, for screen capturing, camera usage. Some of these, um, they are not using it directly, but have some kind of abstraction on top. 
And this is basically where GSTMR was first used in a larger scale. I think it was now 10 years, 15 years ago, long time ago. Nowadays, what uh, um, at least uh, in GNOME, it's also used for is, uh, stuff like camera and sc uh, screen sharing, especially in combination with application sandboxing. But that's a very new project, but nonetheless quite fancy. Um, it's also used in uh, Qt um, for the um, well, multimedia part of the um, library, also for the um, web engine. Um, also, if you want to use uh, well, Java, the Open JDK is using it for um, the um, yeah, multimedia related parts of it. And also, if you use something like LibreOffice, OpenOffice, put a um, video in your um, well, presentation or in, into your documents, and it's going to use GStream in the, in, the, um, in the back end in the end. But as I said, this is all the boring stuff. Let's uh, get to some more interesting things. So the web, nowadays everything is about the web, right? So there we should also have a bit uh, to say. So um, um, in WebKit, um, various ports like the GTK, EFL, Qt, and the Windows Cairo ports, they can use uh, GStreamer. And well, if you use a browser based on that and you go to YouTube or some other website that is uh, providing your videos with all these new HTML5 features, um, those ports are going to use uh, GStreamer in the back. Um, something a bit newer is um, there's also some kind of uh, Blink or Chromium backend made by uh, Samsung. You can get it here on GitHub. It's probably not going to merge at some point into Chromium because Google doesn't like the LGPL, so be it. But um, if you want to build your own browser, you can get the code there and then you can also use our stuff. Another thing nowadays, um, a lot of stuff is about uh, well, real-time communication, having um, things like Skype or similar services. Um, and there's a new web standard called WebRTC and um, made by Ericsson, there's an um, open source implementation of this uh, called OpenWebRTC and it's also completely built upon GStreamer. Um, they are providing all kinds of sample applications for all major platforms and what they are also doing right now is um, integrating it into WebKit. So at some point, if you're using um, like the browser um, of GNOME, you will have um, WebRTC integration based on GStreamer inside it. Um, then, not only on the client side, but also on the server side, it's um, lots of, um, well, products are built on it. There's, for example, Corento, which is some kind of WebRTC HTML5 based uh, streaming server. It's really, well, huge stuff. It's um, looking like a, your standard enterprise uh, server thing, and it can do everything in the end. And somewhere, a little piece of it is also GStreamer, the actual media handling and the network handling. Um, it's also used in all kinds of streaming and transcoding servers. So, for example, um, what I'm listing here is the Rigel DNA, DN, DLNA server, which is um, uh, implemented with GStreamer. And there are also all kinds of um, commercial hardware boxes that you can buy out there, which are somehow using it internally. Now, let's get to a, a bit more fancy things. So, this is a video editor based on GStreamer. Um, well, a non-linear video editor, you can take all your um, movie clips that you want to combine somehow, you can um, cut pieces out of them, you can um, compose it, uh, them together, you can do some kinds of overlays and all the stuff you would expect from a video editor. So this one here, that was PTV, and it's a GTK-based uh, nonlinear video, video editor, completely written in Python, so as I said before, you don't have to write C if you want to use GStreamer. Um, and this one is uh, based on um, a library that is uh, built on top of GStreamer called the GStreamer Editing Services. And well, that's basically the foundation of PTV. What you get there is some kind of um, timeline API. You put clips into this timeline and then somehow with this API define how it uh, should be uh, put together. And this one is also used, used in some commercial products now. Another thing, um, some people like to make music, fortunately. Um, there's a nice application for that, for making um, well, electronic music uh, called bus tracks. Basically what you have there is um, some graphical um, thing where you um, put different devices in there that are producing audio. You're linking them together with all kinds of um, effects and filters. And well, in the end, it's some kind of sequencer, synthesizer, or tracker application. Um, 
just try it, it's quite nice. Another thing, um, maybe some people know about that already is uh, processing.org. It's some kind of uh, language for, well, they're saying it's a language for the visual arts. So um, basically they provide a, sim uh, a simple um, programming language um, that can be used by artists um, to create, um, well, artistic movies and uh, stuff like that. I'm not going to list much about it because I, I can't cover all of that in 20 minutes. Just look at the website, it's really awesome. And for, um, well, integrating videos inside it, uh, it's using GStreamer. But again, really look at the website, it's awesome. Another thing um, at a, big, a bit higher scale where GStreamer is used is, well, you probably saw pictures of things like this, uh, like a huge control room uh, used by TV mm -hmm. studios. They get all kinds of contents everywhere, content from everywhere. Somehow need to um, make the live broadcast program from that or um, uh, take the different movies they want to show, make, uh, create some kind of schedule. So for that kind of stuff, um, it's nowadays used. Important things here are that, um, well, you have different, uh, lots of different um, use cases that are important here. So you have things like um, live recording, um, then broadcasting that out somehow, you have to mix things together, and you have to do all of this with a very defined latency, and it has to be, well, a completely, you, you really have to know the latency of all the things, and make to, you need to make sure that everything is streamed out correctly. Um, another thing that's important here is uh, things like uh, scheduling recorded shows, overlay, overlaying things like, um, I don't know, a new sticker, or um, overlaying the company logo and things like that. Um, in many cases, what people also want to do here is that for um, things like um, codecs and for the composition, they want to make use of um, the GPU. And that's also something we support very well nowadays. And well, nobody really likes it if um, at some point during the um, TV show, you just get uh, a test picture telling you um, there were problems. So this, all this really has to run very reliable, 24 hours, seven days a week, no problems. Um, similar in that um, direction, setup boxes and TVs. So for stuff like live TV, DVB, IPTV, um, it's used in various products. Um, for things like a personal video recorder and um, also for video on demand and well, Andreas will talk about that later. Um, so I just uh, mention a few things here. So there's, for example, the Dreambox he's going to talk about. There's uh, something by the uh, BBC. Um, if you uh, buy their uh, setup boxes, um, it's they are um, running GStreamer on it. Um, well, then by things like um, WebOS and uh, Tizen, it's going to be used. Now let's get a bit higher. So you probably all so all these kind of things when you were um, coming here um, to Australia, unless you are living here. Um, and nowadays, when you have a long flight, people really um, want to have some kind of entertainment system. And um, there are a few companies that are also building those uh, based on GStreamer. What is um, quite important here is that you have things, um, well, that for one, you can uh, use uh, video on demand services like um, making sure that you um, can select, everybody can select a different movie. But on the other hand, um, you always have these annoying announcements and it, you, um, they need to, need to make sure that they are all um, synchronized everywhere, that um, all the speakers everywhere are um, playing the same sound. And that's also where, where GStreamer is used. Um, it's not only used in, um, in planes, but also in cars like um, the Genevi Alliance, which is a huge alliance of um, all kinds of car manufacturers. They are um, defining GStreamer as one of the um, well, building blocks of all this. Then you all probably also saw these kinds of things, video walls, distributed speaker systems. I think uh, Jan is going to talk a bit about these things later, but um, yeah, people are building things like that um, with GStreamer, what is important in these cases is that, well, you have lots of different displays. They should really show all exactly the, the same thing. It should be frame accurate for video. It should be ideally sample accurate for um, audio. And um, yeah, I said before, we may, uh, try to make sure that everything that you m might possibly need is uh, somehow included in GStreamer. And well, Jan mentioned it before for um, um, the talk before that um, we have some kind of network clock support which really allows you to 
make these kinds of things uh, very easily. Um, yeah, and there's also um, a project called Arena, which um, allows you to build systems like that yourself. It's more targeted at um, yeah, uh, media playback inside your house and uh, different rooms and stuff like that. Um, well, in similar um, directions, uh, things like control or command rooms are going or um, dig digital signage. Um, yeah, I just saw I only have five minutes left, so I will skip over a few things and just go to the interesting ones. So, so um, this one here is um, a demo that was made by Ericsson at, um, a while ago based on their um, WebRTC framework. So basically what they had there was um, in Barcelona, someone sitting with, uh, with a Oculus Rift in some kind of simulator for an excavator. And on the other hand, in uh, Sweden, they had a real excavator that was then controlled by that. And all that over a 5G link. And that's also some, something where they use GStreamer. Um, yeah, let's go to, uh, uh, let's skip a few things. Um, then for um, like this event, the um, recording, like what I'm uh, talking about here right now, the recording is um, done by application using GStream, it's uh, called Dim Videos. Um, well, in a few cases, you also would like to uh, deploy your own um, cloud services uh, that are providing media, like uh, deploy your own YouTube, Flickr, or SoundCloud, or things like that. There's um, an application called Media Goblin, also based on GStreamer, which can basically look like this, just a screenshot from their website. Looks a bit like YouTube, just without all the annoying comments and stuff like that. <laughs> um, yeah, then as I said before, we are running on Android and iOS, so I can probably skip the first part here. But there are even some uh, devices like the um, Samsung Galaxy X Cover that are shipping with GStreamer on the device itself. But where people uh, mostly use it um, on these platforms is um, well, for building a actual applications. Um, it's also part of uh, many um, well, embedded Linux SDKs, like uh, for the Raspberry Pi, um, the Raspbian um, distribution comes with GStreamer, um, the Freescale um, SDK comes with GStreamer, and well, we support all kinds of APIs that are somehow relevant for those platforms. Now, um, let's go to the last really uh, interesting projects. So um, you probably saw pictures of these kinds of things. Uh, it's a huge um, um, well, setup for gravitational wave research. It's a few kil uh, kilometers in diameter, really huge stuff. Um, and the one I'm talking about here is uh, LIGO. You probably also heard about it uh, in the news recently. There were some rumors that they actually found something. Basically what they're tr trying to do is somehow with these huge setups, they're trying to find um, well, traces of gravitational waves, some are from neutron stars that are rotating around each other. I don't really know the physical uh, background of that, but it's really fancy stuff. And um, they're using GStreamer there for the large-scale signal processing. They have huge pipelines with thousands of filters in there. And large parts of their software is actually free software. You can get it there on that website. You can look at what uh, kind of stuff uh, these physicists are doing there. And, well, the title was also, um, the title of this talk is also about, well, outer space. So at some point, um, I think it was end of 2014, we got a nice mail from someone uh, working for the European Space Agency. And, um, well, beginning of 2015, they were launching some kind of program for, um, where they had a slightly modified uh, smartphone running a GStream application, and that was used by the astronauts somewhere in space. Really nice by, the t uh, by this person to tell us about it, because well, now we're in outer space. Um, if you want to know some more details about this specific project, there's a paper. It's not too, uh, too big and um, not too technical. It's quite nice what they did there. Yeah, and with that, I will finish for now. So thank you for listening. Any questions so far? Well, we've got time for one quick question, if there is any. One question. Um, you're, you t talked about a lot of applications where there is um, commercial and proprietary use of GStreamer. Do you get much feedback from them and you know, do they can end up contributing to GStreamer? Uh, is is yeah, that a, a lot of things? Um, well